If you have the story of Scripture with you, I invite you to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings 19, it's in the uh, left-hand side of your Bible if you've got a hard copy. If you're on a tablet or a phone, you're in luck. You know where 1 Kings is. Just type it right in. Uh, if you're on Facebook, that's fine. Uh, whatever. I'm, I'm really excited about this sermon series. I think all sermon series matter, but... I, you know, I'm not supposed to have favorite sermon series, but this is growing on me. I know we've only been in it one week, but every week when when we gather around this text, when I say we, uh, the, this team that I get to work alongside of, and we pour through what it means to find purpose and identity, uh, there are some deep, deep waters here. And I'm just encouraged not only by your feedback, but where I see our church uh, as we head into what I think is a very significant season in rediscovering who we are as the people of God. So I invite you, if you're gone, uh, listen to it online because these are going to kind of build on one another and I hope you'll come back next week where we'll celebrate Father's Day. I know that's a good day for a lot of people. It's also a hard day for a lot of people, but we're going to honor both of those spectrums. But we didn't come here to talk about the weather or how good sermon series are. We're here to talk about God and how he reveals himself in the person of Jesus. So I invite you to 1 Kings chapter 19. I'm going to begin in verse 4 because this is the word of God for the people of God. But Elijah himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree and he asked that he might die. It is enough now. Lord, take my life away, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then Elijah lay down under the broom tree, and he fell asleep. And suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. And he looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate, and he drank, and he lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time touched him and said, get up and eat. Otherwise, the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank, and then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. And at that place, he came to a cave, and he spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? Let's pray. God, we pray that these ancient words will live once again in our midst. Pour through me your good gifts of preaching, gifts of story, gifts of imagination. As we long to live in the days of Elijah and say with all of our hearts, there is no God like you. Oh God, be our strength especially in times where we're in the wilderness. For it's in your name that we pray. Amen. My God is a rock in a weary land. Weary land in a weary land. My God is a rock in a weary land, shelter in a time of storm. I know he is a rock in a weary land, weary land in a weary land. I know he is a rock in a weary land, shelter in a time of storm. I first sang that song with Marla Finley and my wife at Harding University in chorus. Dr. Cliff Gaines wanted to expose us to one of the more powerful genres of music, the Negro spiritual. And I didn't even appreciate the significance of that song while we were singing. I was a part of it. It was simply a song, but there was a, a point in our journey in college 
where that song became our story. One of my friends in chorus, his name was Randall. He was from Muskogee, Oklahoma. He actually liked my wife before my wife liked me, if you can imagine that. Randall actually went out on a date with my wife before my wife liked me, but I had my eyes set on Deborah Root, and, well, you can guess who won that fight. <laughs> Randall became such a good friend to Deborah and myself. We got married first. He was soon to be engaged to a sweet gal named Emily. And I never will forget walking into our apartment in Searcy, Arkansas, and the phone rang, and it was somebody informing us that Randall, while standing in the rivers of Colorado, was pulled under by an undercurrent, and they didn't find him for two days. Full ride to Kansas State University. Set to be engaged. 21 years old. Why does that happen? How could they take a friend of mine, a friend of my wife, a friend of a university? How could that happen? So when we sang in chorus, my God is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in a time of storm, that song became more than just a song. It became our story. And we found identity and purpose in the very last place we thought we would the wilderness. Have you been to the wilderness? I, I, I'll be honest, I don't really like the wilderness. I don't really choose to go to the wilderness. It's kind of like, well, before I say this, I'm going to offend, oh, a great majority of you. It's like going camping. Here's what I think of when I think of camping. Camping is what you do before hotels were invented. Can I get an amen? Some of you are like, camping, yes! Let's go to REI and eat stuff out of cans and sleep under the stars. And I'm thinking there's no Wi-Fi or coffee or... Why do that? Well, there's a difference in choosing to go camping and being forced to go camping. Much like the wilderness. I don't think anybody in this room would stand up and say, Pat, I love the wilderness. I love to be by myself where I feel distant from God. Yet each person that follows Jesus, you and me, we experience the wilderness. And the story of Scripture says that the wilderness is where we find identity. My only problem is I don't like that version of identity. I don't like that version of purpose. So a question that I think the wilderness asks is, what happens when your best life now turns into the best lie now? What happens when your version of life goes somewhere in another direction and you find yourself in the wilderness? Here's what I can't get around. God always does work in the wilderness. Think about Israel, 400 years in slavery. 400 years, that's older than our country, friends. 400 years, they cry out, and God finally hears the people of Israel, and he comes and he delivers them, making good on a promise he made in Genesis chapter 12 to the patriarch of their people, Abram. And I can imagine being an Israelite, being in Egypt, being enslaved, thinking, finally, God is going to move us from exile into the land that he has always promised. But God doesn't do that, does he? He goes from Egypt into the wilderness. Why? Perhaps God is trying to teach his people something. And before you get too far ahead of me, I could go through example after example, but I want to point out one that you may have forgotten. It's in the Gospel of Mark. In fact, it's in every Gospel story. And it's a character 
that we don't often think about in the wilderness. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart, the Spirit descending like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, And he was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. Even Jesus spent time in the wilderness. Last week we talked about purpose and identity and how we discover that purpose and identity in the story of God. And the way we experience the story of God is we give ourselves to that story through the waters of baptism. Baptism matters, not so much because what you are delivered from, but what you are delivered into. And here's what I want you to think along with me this morning. God is always delivering us from something into something else because after water comes wilderness. There's a reason that God doesn't take his people through the Red Sea directly into the promised land because he wants to go from water into wilderness. And there is a reason that Jesus finds his identity as the beloved of God. At that moment, he comes out of the water and God the Father says, you are my son, with you I am well pleased. And he goes from water into the wilderness. Wilderness is an outgrowth of our purpose and identity as the beloved of God. And that's why I need Elijah. That's why I need 1 Kings 19. I need this story because it's a servant of God, it's a prophet of God who finds himself in the wilderness. And I found myself this last week alongside of Elijah. Elijah was gently tucked in all by himself out in the middle of nowhere. And I found him there. Speaking of there, do you know what's significant about 1 Kings 19? 1 Kings 18. Let me explain why. 1 Kings 18 has got to be, if you're reading this story, one of the most dynamic moments in all of the history of Israel. Elijah is going head-to-head. This is Mayweather Pacquiao stuff. Head-to-head combat with the prophets of Baal or Baal. And there is an evil king named Ahab and an even more wicked wife named Jezebel. Do you know many people named Jezebel? There's a reason. I once knew a cat named Jezebel, but that's another story for another day. Ahab and Jezebel are out to kill Elijah, and Elijah wants to have a standoff. It's Jehovah God versus all the other gods, lower G. And you know how this story goes. Elijah starts taunting these prophets of Baal. Come on, call on your gods, and they call, and they call. They even cut themselves with knives and stones. Read about it in chapter 18. Then Elijah puts his faith in the God of Israel even soaks his sacrifice with water over and over again. And the story says that the fire that came down from heaven was so hot, it lapped up all the water that was surrounding the sacrifice. (laughs) If I'm Elijah, I'm thinking, oh, our God is an awesome God. I mean, this is an amazing victory for the God of Israel. And if I'm Elijah, I've got my chest pumped out and I'm like ready to take on the world for God. Yet what does Elijah do? Well, he hears that Jezebel now wants to kill him. That's a pretty natural response if you've just been defeated. Wouldn't you agree? Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then Elijah was afraid. He got up and he fled for his life came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there, and then he went a day's journey into the wilderness. Elijah is choosing 
to run away from God and he finds himself in the wilderness. Isn't it interesting that after water, there's wilderness. So what do we learn? And here's the key. Not about Elijah. What do we learn about Elijah's God in the wilderness? Because Elijah has just moved from wonder to wilderness. And I think there's something for us there. And the reason why I say there's something for us there is that there's the same question twice in this chapter that God asks Elijah. The word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? It's a pretty natural question. What are you doing here? Because Elijah has just run from the very place that God revealed himself. Yet, God, or Elijah runs to the very place that God has been for generations after generations. He goes to Mount Horeb. Mount Sinai. It's where God revealed himself to Moses. So God says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Here's what I think God is saying. God is saying, Elijah, even though you're afraid, there's an opportunity for faith. In the midst of fear, there's an opportunity for for faith. Go back through the pages of Scripture and look at those people that God came to. It's always laced with some amount of fear. How do you know that? Because God said, hey, don't be afraid. Genesis chapter 15, he comes to Abram after he's already promised, after Abram has left everything. And God comes to Abram and says, Abram, don't you remember? I am your shield, your very great reward. Do not be afraid. Even when God comes to Mary through an angel, remember what that angel tells Mary? Don't be afraid. Because where there's fear, there's an opportunity for faith. If you find yourself in the wilderness and you are terrified by what the wilderness brings, friends, there's an opportunity for faith. Question, faith in whom? Faith in yourself or faith in the God of the wilderness? Uh, it's summertime, which means that I work very hard to keep my children out of a pool. I don't own a pool. I happen to live in a subdivision that has a pool. It's a great deal. In other words, I can say, no, we're not going to go out in the backyard and swim. We have to walk all the way down the street. Such an inconvenience. But anyway, so we're at the pool the other night. And it's amazing what children forget from one summer to the next. And there's this moment that every parent in the room can imagine. I'm in the water. My youngest son, Andrew, is on the ledge. And I look at him and say, son, you are going to have to jump. And he comes right to the ledge and he starts shaking. I don't want to. So I start trying to convince him of why he can trust me. Andrew, I am not going to drop you. This is only waste deep. But there's fear in that young man's eyes. I can see it. I can almost taste it. But there comes a point where Andrew is going to have to jump. Do you know why? Because when there is fear, there's an opportunity for faith. There's an opportunity for trust. And I want you to know that God is in the water and he is saying, come on and jump because I am not going to drop you. I am not going to leave you. Did you notice that God came to Elijah when he was in the wilderness? I'll be honest, if I'm God and I just displayed my majesty, my glory, my power in chapter 18, I would probably look at Elijah, if I were Elijah's daddy, and say, you know what, you sorry thing, go ahead and pout. Maybe you will die. Good for you. You've got a pretty short memory, Elijah, but that's not what God does. He lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, get up and eat. And he does this twice. Why? Because that's what God does. Could it be that God's faith in Elijah 
was greater than Elijah's faith in God. Come on. When you are in the wilderness, don't you ever forget, I don't need to forget that God has faith in me. And that God will come and be with you. Did you catch that in Mark chapter 4? The Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days. Is there any coincidence that Elijah was in the desert 40 days? Nod your head this way. No, no coincidence. This is on purpose. Tempted by Satan, Jesus was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. Did Jesus need angels? Apparently so. Perhaps in Jesus' most human moment, he needed the assurance that as the beloved of God, the beloved of God was still with him. It's a beautiful thing to be reminded that you're not in the wilderness alone. Amen. I went and saw my good friend, Lisa Skinner in the hospital, have mercy. She's been in the hospital several days. Like some of you have been in the hospital long amounts of days. But George and Lisa said something to me that's becoming kind of the same verse over and over again when, I, when we come and visit people in the hospitals. You know what they say? This is what they say. Pat, I don't know how people do this without a church family. You know why they say that? Because as church, as a family we don't walk through the wilderness alone. We're taking our cues from God. We're taking our cues from Jesus. And if God is going to be with us, we need to be reminded that we are with one another. We are not in the wilderness alone. God comes to us, even when we're fearful, as an opportunity for faith. But then perhaps the greatest part of this story God says, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And if I'm Elijah, I'm thinking, yes, here he comes. Chapter 18. He's going to come with fire. He's going to come with water. Ooh, show it to me, God. There was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains, breaking rocks and pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. But after the fire, listen to the irony, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And then it came a voice to him that said, what are you doing here, Elijah? God is inviting Elijah to listen to a different song that he expected to be played. He was looking for God in fire, in wind, but instead, God says, nothing. Are we willing to trust that music? October 24th, 1987. The Minnesota Golden Gophers were playing the Ohio State Buckeyes in football. If you know anything about football, that means that Minnesota probably did not have a chance. Ohio State was ranked 16th in the country. They were playing on a warm Saturday afternoon. It was 31-0 to zero at halftime at Ohio State. It wasn't their homecoming, but it could have been. Minnesota kept trying. Ohio State kept out-muscling them by the fourth quarter. 42 to 6. But an odd thing began to happen at the Ohio State Stadium. The Minnesota fans started to cheer. The Minnesota fans started to clap and get excited. And this confused all the Ohio State fans because they were winning 42 to 6. You don't really cheer for your team if you're winning 42 to 6, do you? Well, here's what the Ohio State fans didn't realize. That the Minnesota Twins had just forced a game 6 in the World Series when Ken Urbeck 
hit a grand slam home run in the bottom of the eighth inning against the St. Louis Cardinals. And the Minnesota fans were in tune with a completely different game than the one they were a part of. Elijah was in tune with the wrong game. The invitation is, which game are you listening to when you're in the wilderness? Is it the game that's raging all around you? Or is there another frequency you need to be tuned into? Throughout the story of Scripture, Israel is invited again and again and again to not leave the wilderness, but stay in the wilderness because there is a particular identity and purpose that is found in the wilderness. That's why we have the Psalms. If you look at the Psalms, the Psalms are Israel's songbook. And there's a particular section, especially, oh, around Psalm 120. And if you look under the headings, it says, A Song of Ascents. A-S-C-E-N-T, Ascent, like they're going up. Do you know why those are called the Song of Ascents? Because every year the Jews would travel from wherever they were living up to Jerusalem. And as they were walking together, as they walked from generation to generation through the wilderness towards the promised land, they would sing. They would sing and they would be reminded of a chorus like this. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when the enemies attacked us, then they would have swallowed us up alive. Then their anger was kindled against us. The flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. But blessed be the Lord who has not given us up. These are wilderness songs. For the next few moments, we're going to sing this wilderness song. And I want to invite you to move wherever you want to move in this space and pray with somebody if you need to be prayed over and for because you're in the wilderness. In fact, I want to go ahead and invite some of our shepherds, if you don't mind, move out into the aisles. And these shepherds, And their wives will receive you. Because you can't go through the wilderness by yourself. We need wilderness songs. We need each other to remind ourselves that as we're on our way to the promised land, we're not in this alone. Had it not been the Lord who is on our side, wilderness gives us identity. Would you be so bold? is to go this morning and pray with somebody. Talk to God about your wilderness experience.